When I was a child, I had a thing called a BBC microcomputer, and I'm sure there are people in the audience who also had the my sort of age who had a BBC micro. Um, we all had these computers in the 1980s in our bedrooms as children, um, and we maybe we bought them to play games on, or we bought them or we were bought them to do our schoolwork on, but they all had one thing in common. That thing was you turn them on and they go beep, and the first thing you can do with them is you can learn to program on them. In fact, if you want to do something other than learn to program with them, you have to make a conscious choice not to program. That's the very first thing you can do. And what this means is that most people my age um, who have any aptitude for computers have a chance to discover they have an aptitude for it and an uh, aptitude for it and an interest in computers. Um, and they have a platform in their, in their bedroom that they could use to do what I did, which was to hack on it every night and get good. Um, lots of people my age knew how to write at least that too long computer program, 10 print line, the best, 20 go to 10. It fills up the screen, or 10 print something much filthier than that, 20 go to 10, and then go to Dixon's and type into all the machines, and then all of them run out the door and leave the guys running around for a while. So, um, and this was really fantastic. It was fantastic for me the day I got my BBC Micro, my Lego went in a drawer and I never touched it again. It was a wonderful way to spend two or five, five or ten years at the end of my childhood. Um, and what it meant was, when I pitched up at university to study uh, computer science, uh, I thought I knew everything about computers. The very first thing I pitched up at, uh, pitched up at Cambridge in 1996, um, and I was surrounded on my course with a bunch of other people who had broadly the same experience as me. Most of us came in the door having very computers at Um uh, The first thing the course had to do was to convince us that we didn't know. So there was a sort of a 10-week period at the start of the 60, the 60 weeks that Cambridge has to turn you from a sixth form into somebody who could start a PhD. The first 10 weeks largely consisted of hitting the students over the head uh, with one or two uh, implements um, to convince them that there were things that were worth learning. That there were things that you've not learned in those 10 years in your bedroom. Um, and this was a wonderful situation for Cambridge, it was a wonderful situation for the students, it was a wonderful time to be there. Um, I, was, I arrived in 1996, um, I did my undergraduate, I did a PhD, and then towards the end of, um, you know, towards the end of my PhD I took a job as what we call a director of studies. And the job of a director of studies at a college in Cambridge is to um, organise the undergraduate teaching for their subject and to organise the supply of undergraduates, so to organise the supply of people to come and be the next batch of, the next batch of students. And it was a really dispiriting experience. It was lovely working with the kids. But what was really dispiriting was that I found that over, the, over those 10 years, um, we had uh, the number of people applying to study computer science halved. And the sorts of things that the people knew how to do had gone from you know, elaborate versions of that two line plank program down to people who had maybe just done a web page. And so that first 10 weeks, where we were used to a world in which we had to spend those 10 weeks uh, breaking people down and convincing them that they needed to learn. We had to spend about 10 weeks and more bringing people up to the kind of stuff that we used to go to the This was becoming an enormous problem for the university. And then the whole Cambridge cluster, there's an enormous high tech cluster in Cambridge. And the Cambridge cluster is reliant on a, a supply of, um, uh, a supply of, of, of talented, uh, talented Exxon credits. Um, so this was a real problem. A group of us at the university sat down and thought, well, where does this problem come from? What we put our fingers on. We still don't know whether this is true, but what we put our fingers on was we said, well, maybe it's that people don't have those computers anymore. You know, those Commodore 64s and BBC Microsoft and Spectrums have been replaced by PlayStations and set top boxes and tablets and mobile phones. They've been replaced by machines which are enormously powerful compared to what I used to have, but none of them are programmable. They're either not programmable or they're just very hard to get into programming. So we sat down and we thought, well, could we design a machine to, uh, could we design a machine that could fill that niche? Is there a niche um, that we can try and fill? And we had the idea that we wanted to make a thing which was four things. It needed to be um, fun, it needed to get into kids' lives in the same way that most computers in the 1980s got into our lives. It's not a worthy device, it's a device that can do something interesting for us, while that is games and video. We wanted to have something which was programmable, obviously. We wanted to have something which was robust. You saw how little that thing was. You know, it's designed to be pushed into a school bag and taken out a um, hundred times without breaking. And we wanted to have something which was cheap. And our idea of cheap was, well, you can ask a, you can ask a child to buy a school textbook. So if we can make this thing as cheap as a school textbook, then we can ask children to buy them to learn the program. And our idea of what a school textbook cost was 25 US dollars, so about 15 pounds. It turns out that was a really optimistic view of what school textbooks cost these days. Uh, I think if we had a more accurate view of what school textbooks cost, we would have had a more interesting <laughs> So, um, so anyway, um, that was about 2006. Uh, we kind of blundered along our little ambition to just try and get 250 more people to, uh, uh, to apply to be computer science. 
Uh, we're really uh, nostalgic and romantic, and we really want to speak the music brand that's more than anything else. We've ended up with Raspberry Pi, quite a nice brand, but lots of followers on Twitter, and lots of people, many of you have really heard of us, and that's really good news. We never wanted a brand, we just wanted to stick with BBC name. Mm -hmm. We kept having these meetings with the BBC and saying, can we stick a brand on our computer? They kept saying no for a variety of reasons. Um, and the last, well, the last time we tried this was just over two years ago, in May of 2011. We went on to see Rory Catherine Jones, who's the BBC senior technology correspondent. Uh, his wife is, I believe, a BBC trustee, and we thought this was a really good combination. He's a senior, senior on the journalist side, he's got good connections, I'm sure he'll say yes. And he said no as well. But what he said to us was, uh, do you mind if I uh, take a little video of this and put it on the blog? Because we're in the source, we said yes, go ahead, shot out, be fine. Um, we've got 600,000 YouTube views in two days. Um, and we're just a little charity, we've got 600,000 YouTube views in two days. And I remember sitting down across the dinner table from my wife, and I just sat at work pressing F5 uh, for two <laughs> days. I'm watching that hand pop doing you know going up. Um, I sat down with my wife um, on the, uh, the, the second day. We had that oh shit moment where we realised we promised 600,000 people that we would build them a 25 top computer and we had absolutely no money and absolutely no idea how we would do it. Um, and so we spent 2011 um, trying to A, figure out how to have some money and B, figure out how to do it. Um, we got towards the end of the year and we were, still, we were feeling pretty good. We managed to put it off, at least they're cheap, right? So you don't necessarily need that much money, $25. We were able to get together a quarter of a million dollars by throwing a hat, basically, um, a big hat. And um, we, uh, we, so we were happy. We built 10,000 of these. We had a wonderful business model. Uh, we were going to build 10,000 of them, sell them, and then get our money back, and then build some more. Um, and but towards the end of 2011, we got the idea that perhaps these 10,000 within the last experiment, we had a lot of interest bubbling up in social media. My wife is a freelance journalist. Um, quit. Stop taking new missions, started running our social media operation, got a lot of interest. And we started to think these 10,000 units might only last us a few weeks, so there might be a nasty supply shortage in the future. We might get slated from it. Um, and so, what we did, we were very lucky, we, um, we set ourselves up as a very conventional manufacturer. No one manufactures anything anymore. To the extent that anyone's a manufacturer, we were setting ourselves up to be a manufacturer. We were going to buy components, get some money, pay someone to stick them together, get the finished goods, and then ship them. Um, and we were extremely lucky because we found two, just an amazing stroke of luck, we found two companies, two big UK PLCs, uh, RS Components and Premier Farnell, who were prepared to license the design from us, and license the brand from us, and make them themselves and distribute them. And that turned out to be the thing that allowed us to win, or at least allowed us not to, not to, uh, not to fail catastrophically. So in the last two months, we launched on the 29th of February uh, last year. In the last two months, between the 1st of January and the 29th of February, we, um, uh, we changed ourselves, we pivoted around from being a capital constrained, basically screwed company uh, uh, who were going to try and do this amazing thing with hard to money, to being an IP licensing company. All, all we do is we design a thing and we license, we license it out. And that's what allowed us to grow. We launched on the 29th of February. Uh, we signed the, I was just saying, we signed the two contracts with the two companies. We signed one at 6 pm. We queued up the of electricity and we queued up an uh, enormous amount of press coverage um, and we, um, we signed one contract at 6 pm on the 28th and one at 2 am on the 29th and we launched uh, at 8 am on the 29th, took down most of the websites for the whole day, sold 100,000 grocery cards. Um, and so we found out the answer to the how long will your 10,000 last? And how's that out? So that was really fortunate. We've had a great year since. Uh, we've sold one and a half million around the pies. We're starting to get lots of those kind of geeks. We've kind of had this feeling that all you do is just flood fill the community and add a technical hobbyists or sort of geeks um, uh, before we reach any children. Um, we do think a few hundred thousand of our one and a half million have ended up in the hands of children. We see these wonderful anecdotes. Parents send us pictures of their children doing cool stuff and love and so we think we're starting to make some progress. Those photos are the things we have had hard days, and those photos are the things that we're definitely are things that get us through hard days. So I'm going to try and draw three uh, lessons. One is the one that's on the board, which is pivot. We were really bad at school. Um, we, were, we were two months away from running into the and change that business model. And as a result, change the economy, not change the business model, best case, I think we would have sold 30 or 40,000 raspberry pies last year, not on the half a minute. So, not being too wedded, not being too wedded to our, our concept of who we were and our concept of how we did business um, turned out to be our sales here. Um, another one similar related to that is scale, this idea of design for scale. Everything we do with Raspberry Pi has been about design for scale. 
So being an IP licensing company and getting your working capital from affiliate and PLCs is a great way to design for scale. Um, trying to focus on just doing the things you do well, i.e. designing your own environment and brand, and letting other people do things like making cases. There is an enormous ecosystem of most of those in the system. There's an enormous ecosystem of people around the world who make stuff. And that, us not having to worry about all of those things, has allowed us to do more, I think, uh, as a project than we could hope that we really have. Um, and then the last one was kind of, for anyone, we're a charity, um, but it applies, I think, to everyone. Um, we, we're living in an amazing time, right? I mean, we have a million years of you know, rubbing in the dirt to try to get enough food to stay alive. Right, and then 200 years ago or something, you know, there was no productivity growth. There was such slow productivity growth that it was literally eaten by the population. So we live in an amazing time. 200 years ago, something changed. And now if we don't get through 2 or 3% a year growth, something's bad and wrong, we're really unhappy with it. We live in a time when we have an enormous amount of personal power to do things that even our very recent ancestors didn't have to do. So, it's a really amazing time to be alive. So,